everyone, welcome to our Davenant Shorts, where we talk with the faculty, professors, staff, lecturers from Davenant Hall, more specifically towards their Trinity term in 2024, which spans from uh, April 8th through June 15th. So we have about 12 courses, 12 professors that we're talking to about their courses, about what they do, about what they teach, the background. And for today, we have Mr. Joshua Shaw, who's still working on his PhD. So in a year or two, we'll call him Dr. Joshua Shaw. But we got Mr. Joshua Shaw on First and Second Corinthians. So thanks for coming on the show, Mr. Shaw. Thanks, Peter, for having me. It's it's great to to get to know you and to know your your um your listeners and what you guys are interested in. Yeah. So first question, although we talked for about twenty minutes before this, I got to know you a little bit more, but. Yeah. If you can uh, provide the spark note version of Joshua Shaw to our audience and how you became a Davenant Hall lecturer. Yeah, of course. So I think, um, as I was thinking through this, I think the shortest way to put it, because it's kind of the red thread, I think, through my life is um, that I feel like a, a pilgrim, as it were. Uh, and the, in, the end goal for me and sort of my, my vocational pilgrimage is to understand the New Testament and all mm -hmm. of its parts, everything that includes and it started, I think, when I was one and a half or two, when my parents, um, <laughs> yep. my parents taught me that um, that knowledge was more valuable than silver and wisdom than much fine gold. Um, but but more concretely, this just kind of general general passion to learn and to understand God's word and um, to grow in wisdom. Be this began a little more concretely at Hillsdale 10, 12 years ago, where. I was introduced to the whole Western classical tradition and started trying to narrow my focus. And the question became then, okay, I really, I want to understand the New Testament and what kind of tools did uh, or presumed from the Reformation all up to the 19th century? What, what tools did you need to have to do that? And yeah. I realized that the, the trifecta of Greek, Latin, Hebrew were, were on that list as well as some modern languages. So um, I, I've, I've, Kind of, I took it upon myself to get all language, both foreign and um, all learning, both foreign and domestic. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's a, George George Herbert says, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm a firm believer in this. That the poet George Herbert says that that nothing comes amiss in in this world. That you know, you can anything you can pull in is useful. And so for me, there's Greek, Latin, German, French, Italian, Old English, and all of those things. Um, professional study of Greek and Latin classics, as well as patristics, um, Plato, Homer, Virgil. Athanasius, Origen, Eusebius, Tertullian, Augustine, um, Shakespeare and Milton and the English language, because I think that's a heritage that's really important to cultivate as an English oh, yeah. speaker. Mm -hmm. Teaching at all levels from middle school all the way up to, to um, older folks at, a, at our, our Bible studies at church and grad students and everything in the middle and, and just ravenously reading everything I get my hands on. That's That's been my kind of vocational path in the last 10 or so years and then in that process i got to know ad fontes hmm. the publication that davenant puts out yep. got to know some folks there eric hutchinson and professor hillsdale was a mentor of mine knew all these guys he was around davenant when it got started and so slowly I made connections i was watching listening what's going on with davenant and then when i came back it was time for health and family reasons to come back from germany after four years there working on my phd and early Christian studies in Greek and Latin, which was a tremendous privilege. And of course, my German, um, I was a residence, residential scholar there for a little while. Well, we were thinking about doing a whole year or a couple years there, but the, um, we wanted to be near family. So we ended up coming over to Arkansas where I'm helping a young classical Christian school get, get going with curriculum and teaching mm -hmm. and all that. And um, so that's where I'm at. And they said, hey, you should still teach for us online and so that's why i'm lecturing for davina there you go cool so um as a lot of our listeners know and as i'm sure you're well aware of there is there is a there are a ton of theological schools seminaries uh institutions of of whatever stripe especially so the reform stripe and they're growing or they're some are closing whatever it may be but what makes davina hall uh in your in your view unique amidst how many seminaries and theological schools are out there? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And now I'm actually really curious to hear what Alistair or uh, or Tim said. Yeah. Um, You'll have to wait a few weeks, yep. Yeah, but 
but what I what I would say is that Davenant is not completely unique, right? But I think I think it's among relatively few seminaries that puts primary text yeah. and historical that is what everybody has been saying. Yep. In the centerpiece, I, it's a sickness that C.S. Lewis noted in the 1940s that mm-hmm. uh, has now become thoroughly endemic, that people want to, um, you know, whether out of fear or false humility or misinformation or lack of value, they're, they're, they're hesitant to dive into primary sources. But I think, I believe certainly, and I think at Davenant, we believe that um, that this is just the thing that birthed a new era of understanding of God's two books in the Reformation, 15th, 16th century. Yeah, he- hence and, Ad Fontest, what you just described. Exactly, and that it's not an accidental thing, but it's essential to use Aristotelian terminology. It, it yeah. belongs actually to the essence of, of you know, um, following out, using the resources God's given us, using our eyes, using our ears, open them up and observing. I think we often pretend like we are, we we've got things down or we, we know what the new Testament says, but every generation I think is called to new diligence on that. Um, and so I think you can say a couple of things really quickly on this is that one, I think Christ has freed us from false fear and false hope, you know? So on the one hand, we don't have false hopes about what knowledge can bring in this. Uh, it doesn't automatically bring virtue. Um, there are a lot of dangers along the way, but also false fear. It's not, uh, we know what men can do to us in Christ's words. And and so whether it's a pagan or a heretic, we don't have to walk into these diet, these texts and this this history with fear. But like Paul, we can walk on walk into Athens or Corinth, Corinth, Corinth and Corinth, sorry, and we can um, both listen and preach and preach without without any fear of what we're going to hear or what we're going to encounter. Yeah. And and on the other hand, in terms of the value, I love this quote from Thomas Traherne that there's a value in making friends in all ages. Hmm. Um, and with Hebrews, we talked earlier in, in our conversation, the, the epistle of Hebrews says that, you know, about Abel, since we talked a little bit of Greek, I'll just say, non eti lale, that mm-hmm. having died, he yet speaks. And and I believe that this is, this isn't generally true of, of, of ancient to great ancient texts and authors that they still speak to us when we give, give our ear to them, we can learn. And so um, finally, I think there's kind of a, there's an, there's a sacred obligation as well as a privilege in studying history. That is, it's um, it's to listen to the previous generation and generations. What did they say about God's works and wonders? Yeah. And then also to tell it to the coming generations. And so I think this is uh, this is something that is obligatory for those that God's given the opportunity in, in, in the resources as he has right now in, in 21st century America to study what he's done in previous previous generations. Yeah. Well, it seems like in your life, the red thread, which has been moving through is the same one that has run through all the faculty members is all of them from Davenant have been saying back to the primary sources. Let's get back to the reformers of red and continue on their shoulders. Yeah. So it seems like that answer is, uh, is what's shaping Davenant Hall. So mm-hmm. on to what you're teaching first and second Corinthians, my guess is for most, I think a lot of the course names at Davenant are like kind of compelling. They're like moral theology and counseling or uh, sex and gender in modern theology. And they're like, well, first and second Corinthians. Okay, whatever. Mm -hmm. But what maybe describe what you're teaching, especially maybe this helps too with a classicist background um, or classical background, trying to understand the New Testament in its fullness. Yeah, thanks. So the, and I can kind of retool that, that title just a tiny bit and say that slightly more accurate would be the Corinthian church. And so okay. what, what we're going to yeah. look at, we're going to do a slow exegetical study of Corinthians, first Corinthians, second Corinthians, of course, we're going to read and reread alongside it, but we're going to slowly march through chapter after chapter first Corinthians. That's kind of the not struggle. third and fourth or not third and fourth Corinthians that haven't <laughs> been discovered yet. <laughs> no, no, not yet. Unfortunately, um, no, no epistles to the Laodiceans or anything like that. We, um, yeah. but we'll, we'll slowly work through that. Um, and I'll mention some of the other stuff we'll read alongside, but I think one of the things that's overlooked or emphasized too little is, is the history of the Corinthian church. And so yeah. we're, we're going to work really hard on uncovering those who are of Paul, of Apollos, of Peter, and of Christ. Who are these opponents? Who are these, these nebulous figures in the background? What are the real problems? I think Corinthians comes across to people as this kind of disconnected tissue of of all kinds of different topics. And it's not surprising. It's been chopped up into many different epistles by various critical scholars. Sure. But I think there is um, a, 
there is a red red thread through First Corinthians, and that there there are unifying elements, and we're going to work, I think, to understand those. And to do that, we'll read a lot of stuff. And this speaks to the other half of your question about my classical background and yep. where that comes in. We're going to read, um, of course, we're going to read bits of the Pentateuch and other parts of the New Testament Acts and everything to give us that immediate yep. context we need. So that that goes without saying. But then, and the most important being Second Corinthians, of course. Um, <laughs> And then, but then beyond that, we'll read Clement of Rome's letter oh, to the yeah. Corinthians, yep. and then the pseudo epigraphic second epistle, because probably the first, the, er, the first um, early Christian sermon outside of the New Testament, mm -hmm. and it probably is written by a Corinthian. We'll read Pausanias's chapter on Corinth and his description of Greece. So this guy Pausanias wrote the first ever cultural guidebook, hmm. and he's describing Corinth, its history. What did Paul see when he walked into Corinth? Right. I think so that the purpose of that will read that over a few weeks, the the statues, the temple, the cultural history. What's that background um, of Corinth? And then quite a few other um, other things alongside this. But those will be snippets. So we'll look at some um, we'll look at some inscriptions. Hmm. You'll probably do Diagne uh, the epistle to Diagnetus at the very end. We'll have some yep. things like that. But that's the main primary bits. The primary sources will be. New Testament, Old Testament, but then Pausanias, um, and then Clement of Rome, and this pseudo epigraphic epistle. The we'll take some secondary scholarship, and and one of my other passions we haven't talked about yet, yeah, is is helping people see where I think the Reformation reformational education program started by Philip Melanchthon in fifteen seventeen mm -hmm. in Tubingen. You know, he gave in the same year. People often point to the ninety five theses, right? But in the same year, Philip Melanchthon is is giving a is holding an oration, a declamation in in Tubingen, where he's talking about the need for reforming education as well as reforming theology in the church. And I think where that that reached in some ways a bloom um, was the 18th to 19th and 20th century, early 20th, and then it started to die at the very beginning of the early 20th century. Um, and we often look at that time as the downfall, and and that's one narrative you can talk you can. Mm -hmm. you can tell of, the, of the, the liberal protestantism higher you know higher critical scholarship higher critical scholarship all this but there's there's a lot of good men who fought the good fight at the university so not just the old princeton but guys like those of course bob Inc. has been a, a hot topic lately uh -huh. but other guys like d.a schlauter lightfoot uh -huh. frid Godet in france and switzerland philip schaff who came from uh -huh. switzerland america theodore Zahn, who was Theodor Zahn and um, Schlatter are two really great scholars in Germany. So we'll take some writings of those, one of which hasn't been translated before. I'm going to translate for the course um, an uh, introduction to the epistles. And we'll we'll see what these guys have to say. And I think, uh, you know, this is kind of getting toward the very end of it is, you know, why teach this class? Like you said earlier, this there's a lot of um, attractive titles at davenant mm -hmm. hall and, and i would encourage people to take those yeah I'll, I'll be honest i think on first glance it seems like the least attractive title on the catalog but the more you talk i'm sure people are hearing it's sounding like one of the more attractive titles in the uh the catalog i hope so i think there's and i'll tell you what i i hope that the students can take from it that i think they'll see um a powerful letter that deserves to stand alongside romans with it with an extraordinary message for today mm -hmm um paul's theology the christian and i'll just say one thing that the yeah. that the corinthians their their mantra was ponta excessive all things are lawful and the sh most shocking thing about first corinthians is that paul does not say no all <laughs> things right. are not lawful yep and they said all things are ours and paul did not say no they're not <laughs> all how you know what paul did was he said yes all things are yours ponta humon de who makes, but you belong to Christ and Christ is God's. And he said later, yes, all things are lawful, but not all things edify. Mm -hmm. And so I think I think we can take these thoughts and we can see that First Corinthians has a really extraordinary mm -hmm. message for the church today that's underappreciated. That also uni unites a lot of the varied um, issues that Paul's dealing with the First Corinthians. And I hope that people will come away with this with a lot of helpful resources, whether they're teachers or pastors or yeah. seminary students um, that, but as a Christian also that, you know, that I guess I couldn't say better than Paul's own prayer for the Philippians that, that they, I, I, 
I, my prayer is from for myself and from the students of this class that we would that our love would abound in every kind of knowledge and observation or perception. Why? So that we might approve um, what is excellent. That's awesome. Well, you uh, you answered my my next two questions within this within this question. Um, and so just to, just to cap it off for those who are listening, if this, if this course interests you, if, if what Mr. Shaw, Professor Shaw, for those of you who will take this course, if this interests you, we have a coupon code from uh, Davenant uh, Institute, Davenant Hall. It's GGG Trinity 24. And it gives first time students, <clears throat> whether you're auditing or full time students, $25 off your first course. So it's a little bit off the top. So it helps you out a little bit if you're like, man, if only I had $25 less <laughs> that I had to pay, then this is your lucky day. You got <laughs> you got the coupon code for Davina Hall. Well, Mr. Shaw, Joshua, thank you so much for coming on, for using your classical education, for understanding the whole or trying to understand the whole of the New Testament and, and deposit both in our brains, but also enlarge our hearts. Thank you so much for coming on. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Peter. It's, uh, it's a pleasure and, and, and a prayer as well that that, that continue. Of course.